Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about a man named Naaman. We find out that he is a commander of the army of Syria, but he is also a leper. He ends up going down to the land of Israel and receiving a blessing from God through the prophet Elisha. But there are lessons in here, particularly about his preconceived idea of what to expect when he got to Israel, when the blessing was given, versus what the reality was and how he ended up submitting to that reality or submitting to God's simple command to receive the blessing he had hoped for. So let's read this account, understand what's unfolding here, and then we'll back up to draw some lessons out of it. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So being the commander of the army of Syria, he was a powerful man, he was a very wealthy man, and he was very valuable to the king of that nation because it was by his hand that the Lord had given victories to the nation of Syria. But the big flaw in his life, if you will, or the big downfall in his life is the fact that he was a leper. And we don't see lepers really in our nation, but in many third world nations today, there are still people who have leprosy, the affliction that affects the skin and can cause disfigurement, can cause tremendous pain. And anybody who had this would want to get rid of it. And we see that's the case with Naaman and his master, the king of Syria, is supportive of him doing what he needed to do and willing to lay out a lot of money in order to get rid of this leprosy. So let's read verses two and following here and see what happens. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. So again, he's willing to lay out a lot of money to pay the king of Israel is what they have in mind here. Evidently that he has some type of control over the prophet. So maybe they can bribe the king, maybe bribe the prophet and then get the healing that Naaman needs to get rid of this leprosy. But it's interesting how that a captive girl from Israel serving Naaman's wife is the one who revealed, here's how you can be healed. There's a prophet in Israel, and the implication is there's a prophet who is speaking and acting on behalf of Jehovah God. So to prove that Jehovah God is the one true God, and really to show that he is with the nation of Israel at this time. But be that as it may, he has this letter, he has the money, the silver, the gold, the changes of garments to take with him to the king of Israel in order to receive the blessing of being healed. Verse 6, Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. 
And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. See, Syria and Israel were really enemies, as was indicated about the fact that Syrian forces went on raids in Israel and took Israelites captive back to the land of Syria. So the, they're enemies here. And the king of Israel is thinking, well, the king of Syria is picking a fight with me. He wants to go to war with me. And the excuse that he's going to use is the fact that he sent his servant down here, his commander, to be healed of leprosy. And he knows good and well, there is no cure for leprosy. There's no way I can heal him of his leprosy. So he'll be angry. He'll send his army against me. In other words, he's thinking that this is a pretext for war. And that distresses him because he realizes that Syria at this time has great power and can probably do what they want in the land of Israel without much fear. There's not much ability on Israel's part to resist. But notice what unfolds next, beginning in verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So when the prophet Elisha hears that the king is distraught, he sends a message and basically says, there's no need for you to be upset, to be distraught about this. Send him to me, and the idea is, I will heal him, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Again, going back to the idea that Jehovah God is the one true God, and that Jehovah God is working through the prophet and speaking through the prophet of Israel. This would be a sign not only to Naaman and to those around him, but it really is a sign to the people of Israel as they are to understand Elisha is the spokesman of God. So Naaman goes to his house, and when he gets to his house, Elisha doesn't come out, but he sends a messenger to him to tell him, go dip in the river Jordan seven times. When Naaman, the Syrian, hears this, he becomes furious about it because he thought, well, the prophet should come out to me he should wave his hand over the place. He should do some type of ceremony, if you will, do some type of performance and impress me with that to make me believe what he's doing is having an impact and effect on me to heal me. So he wanted to see something amazing, perhaps, in this. And because he doesn't get what he expected to get, then he turns away and begins to go back in a rage. He made the comment in this, well, are not the Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the rivers of Israel? He thought his rivers in his hometown were better than the rivers in Israel, and he should just be able to go back and wash in those. And he doesn't understand why the prophet has told him, go dip in the river Jordan, dip in it seven times and you'll be healed. Well, his servants come along and they talk some sense into Naaman. And they approach him like this. Well, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? If he had told you to go up on the top of a mountain and build some type of monastery and fast and pray for a month, 
to be healed, wouldn't you have done something like that? So why don't you just go and dip seven times? Just do what he says, wash and be clean. So he calms down and he goes, he dips seven times and he is cleansed. His leprosy is gone. His flesh is restored like the flesh of a little child. Now let's think about the lessons that are contained within this. And one of those lessons is that there is cleansing from God for people of every nation. Remember again, Naaman is a Syrian. That means he is a Gentile. And Jesus even points this out in Luke chapter 4 when he was in the synagogue at Nazareth. And he points out to the people, to the Jews who were in that synagogue, that there were many lepers in the time of Elisha the prophet, but only one, that is Naaman the Syrian, was healed. That is pointing out that God was working with the Gentiles and blessed the Gentiles because at this time in 2 Kings 5, the Israelites are sinful and corrupt and God was trying to teach them a lesson. So he is a Gentile, but yet he receives a blessing from God. And let's understand that there is a cleansing for all people today, not a cleansing of the flesh, but a cleansing of the soul that is available to all men today. Remember, Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who is baptized will be saved. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And so it is that the Lord said to the apostles, take the gospel into all the world. Take it to all nations. As he said in Matthew's account, make disciples of all nations. So all people can receive the gospel message and can be cleansed of their sins. God doesn't favor one people over another people. God is no respecter of persons. If you recall in Acts chapter 10, when the gospel was first opened up to the Gentiles, in Acts 10, Peter is sent to the household of Cornelius, but Peter doesn't understand why that is. He did not think that the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles. And so he was confused why it was that he was called to go there, why it was that the Spirit of God told him to go there. But when he got there and Cornelius was explaining the events that led up to it, Peter said this in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So God does not hold respect toward people, that is, favoring one people above another. He doesn't favor one nation above another. He doesn't favor one ethnicity above another, one color above another. He doesn't prefer men above women or women above men. The Lord wants all people to hear the gospel. He wants all people to hear the truth, to come to a knowledge of the truth, and to obey that truth so that they can be cleansed. So it is, we see in the account of Naaman, the leper back in 2 Kings chapter 5, that the Lord wants all men to be blessed. And he has a cleansing that is available to all men. And it's in God's providence that you are watching this right now, that you may hear truth, respond to that truth, and be cleansed of your sins. You have that opportunity to act on the will of God, to submit to his command that he would give you. Now, as we continue to consider this, we understand it's not the messenger that matters, but it is the message. Again, in 2 Kings chapter 5, when Naaman went to Elisha's dwelling, that Elisha sent his messenger out there. He sent his servant out there. Elisha didn't go out and declare to Naaman what he needed to do to dip in the River Jordan seven times to be cleansed. He just simply sent his messenger out there. And so it's the message that matters, not the messenger. 
And just a quick point on that. You know, there are a lot of people today who are under the impression that a preacher or what they commonly call a pastor needs to have a certain degree of reputation, maybe a certain level of education, a certain type of training in order to be legitimate, in order for people to listen to him. And if they don't have that, well, then that person's not worth listening to. So they would listen to someone who preaches for a congregation of, let's say, 5,000 people before they would listen to someone who's preaching for a congregation of 30 people because they think, well, that man has more credibility. They're thinking about the messenger and not the message. Or they might think, well, he needs to go to some type of theological seminary before I'm going to listen to him, because those are the men who really know what they're talking about. He needs a certain type of degree, a doctorate of divinity degree, some type of ministry degree, perhaps. And that's the person I'm going to listen to versus somebody who has no degree, somebody who just started reading the Bible and began to tell others what he read about. And so they put the emphasis on the messenger instead of the message. But the Bible shows us it's the message that matters, not the messenger. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is addressing that very issue when he's talking about the resurrection of the dead and the error that was being taught among the brethren there. And he's trying to correct that error. He makes a statement there about the gospel being delivered to them and that it really didn't matter who it was that preached it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 11, and he's talking about the resurrection again. He says this, Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Whether it was I or they, whether it was me or someone else, whether it was Paul, whether it was Peter, whether it was Apollos, whether it was any other man, it didn't matter. What mattered was the message that you received, the message that you believed, the message that you obeyed. So we have to be people who desire the truth, who want to know the truth. And when someone comes to us purporting to deliver that truth, to teach it to us, we need to examine that message. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says that, when Paul arrived at Berea, says these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So these people weren't focused on the messenger. They were focused on the message. They weren't looking at Paul. They were looking at the scriptures. Okay, he said this, Now, let's go search the scriptures to find out whether these things were so. And that's what we encourage you to do. Don't pay attention to the messenger so much. Don't think, well, this man with a large church under his direction or under his leadership, that that is a person that I need to listen to. And whatever he says, I need to accept because look at all the people that are under his influence and are following after his message. There must be something good there. No, you take that message and compare it to what is written in the word of God. Is it the truth? Is it not the truth? Does it harmonize with what is written in the scripture or is it out of harmony with the scripture? No matter who it is that delivers that message. And when you hear that message, You need to submit to it when it is in agreement with the Word of God. Now, let's understand the truth is truth no matter who teaches it, but also error is error no matter who teaches it. So it doesn't matter how popular the person is, how long they've been around, how kind they may be in their personality or gentle or personable or warm. It doesn't matter because Error is error no matter who teaches it, and truth is truth no matter who teaches it. So it's not the messenger that matters. It's the message 
as we see in 2 Kings chapter 5. But then we also want to notice this in 2 Kings 5, 11, that Naaman became furious when he realized what he expected wasn't going to be the case. It says that when he heard the message to go dip in the river Jordan seven times, he said to himself, I will surely, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So he had this preconceived idea of what should happen. And he thought there should be some type of excitement, some type of emotional performance that was put on by the prophet, maybe even to get Naaman himself excited about it, about what was going to take place in his healing. So you you see that there are people who believe that there should be some type of performance or some type of um, activity, the waving of the hand and things like that in order for a healing or a cleansing to take place. And of course, this was a physical cleansing, a physical healing of Naaman the leper, but people believe that about spiritual cleansing, about the soul being cleansed of the sins. There are people who think that it can be done with, if you will, the wave of a hand, so to speak, that they they may even say people who preach on TV will put your hand on the TV or send in a prayer cloth and I'll pray over that and you'll be cleansed and send in a, a donation and God will bless you abundantly, things like that, that there's some type of uh, symbolic uh, type of activity associated with it. But the reality is that the command of God was very plain and simple to name and go dip seven times. And when that didn't meet his expectation, then he became very upset, very put out about that. But let us understand that God doesn't put on a performance for us. He doesn't expect us to put on a performance, if you will, um, the people who are conveying God's will to us, we shouldn't expect them to put on some type of performance to, to wave their hand or get everybody excited about things, because the Bible's very clear. The Lord's commands are relatively simple. They are down to earth. They are plain and easy to understand. You think about this fact that God does require us to do something. See, Naaman thought, well, the prophet's going to come out here and wave his hand. But instead, the prophet sent a messenger out and told Naaman what he needed to do in order to be cleansed. In Acts chapter 2, when the apostle Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he is teaching the Jews about Jesus being the Christ, these the very people who called out for the blood of Christ, who were saying, crucify him, crucify him, that he laid out the evidence that Jesus is the Christ. And it says in Acts 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They ask, what do we need to do? We, we believe what you've said. Essentially, they're saying here, because otherwise they wouldn't have been cut to the heart, but they're cut to the heart because they've been convicted that Jesus is the Christ. So they ask, what do we do? How are we cleansed of our sins? How are we made right with God after we've killed his son? And we realize that this is a pattern in the New Testament in Acts chapter 9. Remember, Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, to arrest them, bind them, have them thrown, maybe thrown in prison, maybe have them killed. But on the way to Damascus, the Lord confronted him. And in Acts 9, verse 5, Saul of Tarsus said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He recognizes there's something to do. That he, he confesses that he believes Jesus is Lord here when he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? After Jesus has said, I'm Jesus. <laughs> so 
He says, Lord, he acknowledges Jesus as Lord, but then he says, what do you want me to do? Now, notice what Jesus said. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Jesus did not respond. There's nothing for you to do. You just confess that I'm Lord and that's enough. No, rather, Jesus told him, arise, go to the city. You'll be told what you must do. And as you read on down through Acts chapter 9, you realize that a man by the name of Ananias was sent to Saul and told him what he needed to do. And he told him, as we have a very specific detailed record in Acts 22, where Paul recounts what it was. But we'll come back to that in a minute. The, the thing we want to understand here is that there is something for us to do. It's not the waving of a hand. There's not some type of exciting performance that takes place that gets everybody's blood pumping that brings about cleansing or is evidence even of redemption or cleansing or salvation. As Naaman the leper thought, he thought, well, the prophet's going to come out here and wave his hand and, and call on God and I'll just be healed. But instead, he got that message, here's what you need to do. And that's what we want to think about next. He told him, go and wash in the river Jordan seven times. In verse 12, Naaman said, are not the Abana and the far part rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Naaman refused to do what the prophet told him. And really what he's doing is he's refusing to do what God commanded him because he had this preconceived idea. He had some prejudices in his mind and he thought, well, I could go to the bond on the far part. Well, let me ask you this. What if Naaman at this point had said, I believe the Lord God of heaven can cleanse me of my leprosy. And I call on him now to cleanse me of that leprosy, to make me whole and clean. Would he have been cleansed? Would his lepr leprosy have been taken away? What if he had said, well, you know what? The Abana and the Farpar are rivers that are just as good as this Jordan River. In fact, they're better than the Jordan River. I'm going to go dip in them. And I'm and he went back and he dipped in the Abana seven times and he went over to the Farpar and he dipped seven times. Would he have been cleansed? And the answer is no. What if he thought, well, I'll go down to the River Jordan and I'll dip one time, but I'm not going to dip seven times because that's ridiculous. And so he dipped one time and came up out of the river. Would he have been cleansed? Well, no, he wouldn't have been cleansed because the prophet told him, go and dip in the river Jordan seven times. What if he had dipped five or six times? Would he have been five sevenths or six sevenths cleansed? And we know the answer is no. He wasn't cleansed at all until he did everything the prophet told him. He had to go to Jordan and he had to dip seven times times. Not one, not four, not six, but seven times. He had to do it all in order to be cleansed. And when he did that, he came up out of that river and he was cleansed. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. He was made whole again. But you know, there are people today who get the idea that they can do what they want to do when they hear what the gospel tells them to do in order to be saved, they begin to react to that, begin to push back against it. Well, that's not what I thought should be done. That's not how I see it. And so they will refuse. Some will even become furious like Naaman when they hear what they're supposed to do. You remember Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, if we're going to have faith, we have to hear the word of God. And Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe will be condemned. So you have to hear the word of God to develop that faith, to believe that Jesus is the son of God. And we have to repent of our sins. We have to turn away from them. We read that a while ago in Acts 2, verse 30 
37 or 38. Let's look there real quick. In Acts 2, verse 37, remember that the apostle Peter was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 38, he tells them what they need to do. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here's what you need to do. Repent, turn away from your sin, and be baptized to have your sins washed away. You do that, and you will have the remission of your sins. So the people had asked, what shall we do? Because they believe Jesus is the Christ. And Peter told them what they needed to do. In Acts chapter 22, Acts 22, this is the Apostle Paul recounting the events on the road to Damascus, and then what happened when he got into Damascus. In Acts chapter 22, verse 12, he says, A certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, that he came to him and preached to him to tell him what he needed to do. In Acts 22, verse 16, this is what Ananias said to Saul. And now while you're waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You think about what is happening here. On the road to Damascus, Jesus confronted him and he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. And then Saul responded, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord told him, go into Damascus and it will be told you what you must do. In Acts 22, we have the record of what he was told. Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins. Yes, there's something that we must do. Some people, though, don't think we need to do all of what God says. Some think, well, just believing is enough. All you have to do is believe and receive Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. So they that's kind of like name and saying, well, all I have to do is dip one time in the River Jordan or all I have to do is dip seven times, but he goes to the Abana or the far part to different rivers. Think, well, I can kind of do what God says, but I'll have to do all of what God says because that's the way that I see it. Well, that doesn't work. Naaman wouldn't have been cleansed dipping one time in the River Jordan. He had to dip seven times. He had to do all that God commanded him. And we can't be saved just by doing one thing of all that God tells us to do in order to be a disciple, to become a child of God. So we have to believe Jesus is the Christ. We have to repent of our sins as Peter preached. We have to confess him before men, as Jesus said in Luke 12. If we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father in heaven. If we don't confess him, he will not confess us. So we must confess him before men and we must be baptized. And yet there are people who will refuse to do that. There are people who reject that. They'll accept all those other things. They'll accept that they have to believe, that they have to repent, that they need to confess Jesus as the Christ. But then they will stop short and refuse to be baptized and say, well, if I'm baptized, that means I'm trying to earn my salvation. Well, let me ask you this. Was Naaman earning his cleansing when he obeyed the message of the prophet, and went and dipped seven times. Well, of course he wasn't earning that. He could not earn that cleansing. He couldn't pay for it. And if you go back and read the account, the prophet did not receive payment for it. You understand that Naaman was only cleansed when he did all that God told him to do, when he humbly submitted to it, and he wasn't earning it. And we can only be cleansed in our souls if we do all that God commands of us. And so we encourage you, look into the Word of God. Learn the lessons from Naaman that you need to set aside preconceived ideas and notions. You need to simply accept the message that is preached by the Word of God. Give heed to the message, not the messenger, but to the message. And then do all that God commands you to do. And if you'll do that, you can be cleansed of that which is corrupting and destroying to your soul. You can be made whole and new again. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. 
Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. Does the Bible matter? Well, that's kind of like asking, does air matter? Does water or sunshine matter? Of course those things matter. Air, water, sunshine, they matter because without them, physical life could not exist. And without the Bible, spiritual life could not exist. You know, without the Bible, we would not have a standard by which men are to live. Now, not the right standard. There are many who try to come up with their own standards out there, but those standards fall far short of what is revealed in the Word of God. And the Word of God matters because it is the one book that addresses the problem of sin and gives us the remedy for sin. It gives us the answer to sin. In Genesis chapter 3, all the way back at the very beginning, Adam and Eve are in the garden. The serpent comes along and tempts them to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here it says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. The nature of man we see hasn't changed. That Adam and Eve acted on their own self-will here. They decided what they wanted to do instead of submitting to God's will. God had given them the command that they were to not eat of the tree which was in the midst of the garden, and yet they stubbornly went ahead and did it in giving in to the temptation of the devil. And notice what happened next. When God confronts them about their sin, in verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And then God confronted Eve and asked her about what she had done. And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Do you see what they're doing? They followed their own will. And then when they get caught, they're guilty about it and they're confronted on it. They try to blame someone else for their actions instead of taking responsibility. In Genesis chapter 4, you read about Cain and Abel, how they offered sacrifice to God Abel's was accepted, Cain's was rejected. And what happened with Cain? He became envious of his brother and he rose up and he took his life. He murdered his brother. You see, the nature of man hasn't changed any today that we still do things that we want to do instead of what God tells us to do. We are self-willed. We tend to want to blame others for our actions. Well, they provoke me. They, they did this. They said that. And that's why I'm acting this way instead of taking responsibility for ourselves. And sometimes we want to say, well, the devil made me do it. And the devil tempts us. Certainly that's true. But the devil doesn't make us do anything. He doesn't have that power. He has the power to lure us. He has the power to tempt us. But he doesn't have the power to make us do anything. But we want to blame him. We want to shift that responsibility away from ourselves. And then when we see people who are doing what's right, sometimes we get angry about that. And we begin to attack them and say bad things against them and maybe even want to hurt them. As Cain wanted to hurt his brother and did indeed hurt his brother. So just the idea that the nature of man has not changed and the Bible reveals this. And as we read the Bible, we see that it reveals our nature, our rebellion and sin and corruption, we recognize that there's rampant evil even today with families being destroyed by divorce. There's high murder rates. It seems like we see that in the news quite a bit. We know there are many abortions in our nation, um, robbery, alcohol, drug use, all these things that are corrupting and destroying men and women and their lives, the lives of their children, the families being destroyed. And so there is moral corruption in this world, but there's also doctrinal corruption 
in this world. You know, the, the Bible teaches us over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that Timothy was to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, for the time will come when they will endure, not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So there's the issue of moral sin on one hand, but there's the issue of doctrinal sin on the other. Moral sin has to do with with our character, with our purity before God. And doctrinal sin, in a sense, has to do with that character and purity, but it's it's more of the beliefs and the practices concerning our religious convictions versus our moral behavior day by day, but our religious convictions. And there are people who accept God's teaching on moral principles, but they don't follow it on doctrinal principles. For instance, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said, called no man father, but there are some who want to give men religious titles. They want to give them the title of father or give them some other type of title, maybe reverend. And that is something Jesus specifically condemned. And so that would be a doctrinal error. That would be contrary to the teaching of the New Testament. There are those who believe in many paths. You remember Matthew chapter 7? In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, where Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount there, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, the Bible tells us that there is a narrow way. In other words, there's one path. There's one path to heaven. All other ways, the broad ways, are not going to heaven. Rather, they're leading to destruction. And if we listen to the religious leaders around us in our society, we get the idea from them there are many paths. You just pick the path of your choice. You just pick whatever pleases you, whichever way you want to go. And as long as you're sincere and, you know, morally good, everything's okay, you're going to go to heaven. Don't worry about it. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches one path, teaches a narrow way that leads to life. And so when it comes to this problem of sin, whether it's moral or doctrinal, the Bible has the answer for us, and that's why the Bible matters. It teaches us right from wrong. It teaches us how to treat fellow man, and it teaches us how to be in fellowship with God. And so that's why we need the Bible. That's why it's important. It's as important to our souls as air and water and sunshine are to our physical bodies. And it shows us, and it's the only thing that shows us, how to be cleansed of our sin. So does the Bible matter? Yes, absolutely the Bible matters. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search word and sword TV program. Faith in God is a fundamental doctrine within the word of God. And yet some people have a hard time of grasping what it is, or maybe through negligence, they forget what what it is. This is what happened to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 5. They are being rebuked for not holding on to very basic teachings in the Word of God. In verse 12 of Hebrews 5, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and have come to need milk and not solid food. So, these first principles, these elementary principles, 
they had forgotten. They had let those things go from their minds and their hearts. In chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So they had let even this concept of faith toward God fade from their minds and their hearts. And we want to make sure that we have a proper understanding because we need to take that foundation and build on it in order that we might be those who are pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says this, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In order to please God, we have to believe that he is and we have to believe he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And those are the two things we want to look at in our study together now is believing that God is and understanding he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So to begin with, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, and notice verse 4, a fundamental concept that we understand in so many different areas, and yet people have difficulty with this in the religious realm. Ephesians or Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. You see, we understand this in reference to a house. If we walk through a neighborhood and we see a house, we know, well, somebody built that house. If we go through the woods and see a cabin and there's a house there, we understand somebody built that house. We recognize that there was thought, there was planning, there was energy and effort, there was intelligence in putting together that house, that dwelling. We understand that when it comes to other things, other technologies, if it's a watch or if it's an automobile or a rocket ship, we understand somebody conceived of that, somebody designed it, somebody thought through all the issues that needed to be thought through in order to bring this into being. And then they took materials and put them together and brought it into being. And so we get that. We understand that. But yet there are some people who dismiss that idea. You and I cannot dismiss that idea. We have to understand that he who built all things is God. There is a God of the universe who created all things that we see. And that God is a transcendent God, a God above all gods, if you will. That's what Paul was preaching in Athens over in Acts chapter 17. Remember that as he was in Athens, his spirit within him was stirred because he saw the city was given over to idolatry. So he proceeded to teach the people about the one true God because he saw all these different idols and including one that was dedicated to the unknown God. And he says, I'm going to tell you about that unknown God in Acts 17 verse 22 then. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, and has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, 
Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. You understand that God is not like the idols of the Gentile world of times past and even of the pagans today. He's not gold or silver or wood or stone or anything like that. God is beyond the material realm, but yet he's the creator of this material realm. He is the great I am, the self-existent one, and has all authority and power in this world. He still rules in the kingdoms of men, and he sustains life. Remember again back in Hebrews, this time chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, and here the Hebrew writer opens it up by pointing out that God spoke to the fathers in times past through the prophets. And verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And he upholds all things by the word of his power in verse 3. He upholds all things. He sustains life. He brought it into existence and he sustains it by the word of his power. This is the God of the universe. This is the God in whom we must believe. And we have to believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, some religions out there believe that there is only one being that is divine. But the Bible teaches us that there are three beings that are divine. There's one divinity, one nature of God, and there are three beings who share that nature, who have that nature in common. Look at Hebrews, or rather Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4 and verses 4 through 6. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There's one body, one spirit, verse 4. There's one Lord, verse 5. There is one God and Father, verse 6. It's sort of like in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus gives the Great Commission. He tells them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There are three beings in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of them are divine. All of them are God. And we must believe in all three of them. Now, there are some people who have a challenge with that. And say, well, how can there be three beings, but there not be three gods? Because the Bible says there's only one God. Well, there's only one divinity. There's only one nature of divinity, sort of like there's only one nature of humanity. So think about it this way. There's one humanity, but billions of humans, right? There are billions of people, billions of beings that share the nature of humanity. And there is one divinity, one godness, and there are three beings that share that, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have to believe in that deity, in God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, or we can't be pleasing to him. And that God has revealed his will in his word. We must understand that, that if he loves us, as John 3.16 says, that he loves the world, and he gave his only begotten son, well, he's conveyed to us how it is we can know him and how we can have fellowship with him and that we are to have fellowship with him. Faith toward God, though, we need to understand, involves more than a simple mental understanding or mental acceptance that God exists, because even the demons believe and tremble, it says in James 2.19. The demons believe, but they're not right with God. They're not redeemed. They're not pleasing to God because they are disobedient to God. So really, biblical faith goes beyond the mere idea of simply understanding something. 
of accepting something. I accept that God exists. Well, that's not enough to be pleasing to God. I accept that Jesus is the Christ. Well, that's not enough to be pleasing to God. So we look in Hebrews again, chapter 11, and notice that it gives us a list of examples of what biblical faith really is. In verse four, it says this, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. So here is Abel described as doing something by faith, of offering a sacrifice to God by faith. You have Cain and Abel, both of them offer sacrifices, but only one of them offered the sacrifice by faith. Both of them believed in God. So there's one who had faith and one who didn't, yet they both believed. Do you see that? There's one who had the biblical faith, who took action according to God's will. Again, verse 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. You see, Noah had biblical faith, and what that did is it drove him to prepare an ark, drove him to get ready for that flood that God had warned him about. And so you go on down through this chapter and you understand when it says that Abraham or Sarah or Moses, that they did something by faith, it means that they not only believed that God existed, but they acted on God's word, what God commanded of them. They were heroes of faith, as we sometimes call those in Hebrews chapter 11. They were ones who kept God in their daily life, and we need to keep God in our daily life. We need to be those, as verse 6 again says, that please God because we believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, if we don't have God in our daily life, we're not diligently seeking him. We have to diligently seek him. Now, we can know God exists by looking at the universe, but we can't know who God is apart from his word. We have to go to what he has revealed to us about himself. We have to go to what he's revealed that pleases him. So we turn to his word, we study his word, we meditate upon his word, we seek God's wisdom and help in this life. So we have to keep God in our daily lives if we're going to be pleasing to him and trust in him and know that he's going to open doors for us to know the truth, to understand that truth, to obey that truth. Now, we don't offer a sacrifice like Abel when he offered up a blood sacrifice. That command is not to us. We don't build an ark like Noah built an ark because that command is not to us. We don't journey like Abraham did because that's not what's required of us. We don't cross the Red Sea. We don't keep the Passover because that's not commanded of us. We live under the gospel of Christ. So we obey the commands that are given in the gospel of Christ. We urge you, we encourage you that you would be someone who has faith, who adds this foundational principle, elementary principle in your life that you would believe that God is and that you would have true biblical faith in that you diligently seek him. So we encourage you, search the scriptures and reach out to us that we may study together and learn more about the will of God. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father. 
Dictionary.com defines a story as a narrative, either true or fictitious, in prose or verse, designed to interest, amuse, or instruct the hearer or reader. Some stories are fictitious, that is, they're not true. They're just make-believe. They're made-up stories. Many of the movies and much of the entertainment that is out there today is fiction. It's something that a person just invented or created in their own mind. Other stories are true, and really the best stories are true stories. They are stories that are rooted and grounded in actual history, facts, things that happened, events that took place in times past. And the Bible has the best stories of all stories because they are absolutely true. They're accurate because the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's God breathed. It was directed by him. And so what we have recorded in here is absolutely true and completely accurate. And it has a bearing on time and eternity. So we want to examine stories from the Bible by learning the recorded history of the Bible and its stories. You'll find out a lot of things that are helpful and useful. You can learn about the purpose and the meaning of life. You can find a peace and a contentment and help and hope in your time of need. We want to turn our attention to one of the most ancient stories recorded for man because it goes back really to the beginning of man and man's existence on this earth. And that is the story about Adam and Eve being in the garden when they were tempted, when they committed sin, and then the consequences of the sin that unfolded. So let's talk first of all about the commission of the sin. In Genesis chapter 3, let's read together verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So you see that the serpent comes along and that's the devil. And the devil lies to Adam and Eve about this because he says, you will not surely die. God has said you would die. And the devil says you will not die. You see, the devil lies to us. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. He does not have the truth in him. You see, the devil deceives us into thinking what God has said is not true, what consequences God said would unfold won't happen. And so you can go ahead and commit the sin. You can go ahead and violate the will of God. So he blinds us to the truth. He blinds us to the real consequences. If we saw and believed the truth, we would not violate the will of God. Just like if Adam and Eve really were focused on what God said and the consequences God said would unfold, they wouldn't have eaten of that fruit, but they became blinded to what God said. They believed the lie the devil told them and focused on the fruit. They focused on that alluring piece of fruit when it says it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, tree desirable to make one wise. They were tempted to eat of that and focused on it. They gave in to the lie. And when we sin, we give in to the lie. Now, Adam and Eve, let's understand, were tempted in three ways, as we just noted there. Desirable, it was good for food, so lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. A tree desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. You know, the Apostle John talks about this over in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, where he gives a warning 
about following after these things. He says in 1 John 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Do you see that? He says, if you have the love of the world in you, the love of the Father's not there. And then he explains what's in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, exactly the three ways that Adam and Eve were tempted in eating of that fruit. Jesus was tempted the same way. If you go and look at Matthew chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says he was tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. It's not saying there that Jesus faced every single very specific temptation that you and I ever face. It's saying he faced the same types of temptation, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The idea of him, lust of the eye, looking over the kingdoms, the devil saying, well, I'll give you all these kingdoms, lust of the flesh, turn these stones to bread, the pride of life, throw yourself off the temple and his angels will come and rescue you. So the devil tempted Jesus the same way he tempted Adam and Eve, the same way that we are tempted today. And Adam and Eve, let's understand, were tempted even though they were perfect. Do you remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, where God has created all things, including Adam and Eve. He created Adam and Eve in his own image. And in Genesis 1, verse 31, it says, Then God saw that everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. Not sinful, not sort of good, but everything he made was very good. That included man and woman. That included Adam and Eve. Man is made upright in the image of God. Adam and Eve were, and all of us come into this world, upright, created in the image of God, but yet we are still tempted. There is no such thing in the Bible as inheriting a sin nature. Notice James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, where James talks about how sin comes about. How is it that we enter into sin? In James 1, verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Don't be deceived about this, that we sin when we're tempted and drawn away by our own desires. Now, God has created us with desires within us, but those desires are neither are not wrong in and of themselves. It's when we fulfill them in a sinful way. It wasn't wrong for Adam and Eve to eat. They needed to eat. They were told they can eat of all the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it wasn't sinful to eat. They had a desire. They had a need. They had a craving to eat. But when they fulfilled that desire, contrary to God's will, that's when they sinned. And so we are tempted just like Adam and Eve. They were perfect, but they were tempted. You see, some people think that the reason we sin today is we inherit a sin nature. And that's the reason that we violate wills God and we can't help ourselves. Well, why did Adam and Eve sin? They were created perfect in the image of God. They were completely pure before God. And I submit to you that we sin for the exact same reason Adam and Eve sinned, because we give in to temptation when that desire is there before us, within us, and the devil puts the temptation in front of us, and we give in to that temptation. As James said, we give in to it, then sin 
is brought to being and sin takes us to death, that is, to spiritual death. So the question may come up, well, why does man even have the ability to sin? Why didn't God just make us where we can't sin? The answer to that question is love. We have to choose to love God. God did not make us where we are compelled to serve him, where we cannot help it, where we're programmed to do that, because there's no choice there and there's no love there. He wants us to choose to love him, to choose to do his will, to choose to please him. And so there is the issue of love. That choice opens up the door for choosing right or wrong. And if we love God, we're going to choose right. If we choose wrong and we love God, then we're going to turn away from that wrong and seek God's help when we have committed something or done something that is wrong. Now, one other thing I want us to notice before we get to our next point, you know, this sin was committed by Adam and Eve because they were tempted. They were drawn away by their own desires and enticed, and they gave in and ate the fruit. Let's understand that this sin could not be hidden from God. They thought it could be hidden, but it couldn't be hidden. And so God now confronts them about the sin that they have committed. Let's look at this in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and conception and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then Adam, to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so you see there are consequences that unfold because of the sin that is committed. The first consequence we want to understand was death. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, if you notice here, when the Lord originally placed man in the garden and gave him this command, he said something very specifically would happen. Then the Lord God said to, uh, or the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis 2, 16 now, and the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did you see that? In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, Adam and Eve, when they partook of that fruit, they didn't drop dead physically right then and there. Now, they get kicked out of the garden and don't have access to the tree of life anymore at the end of the chapter. And so physical death does occur later down the road. Adam lived over 900 years. And so it was much later that this happened. But there was a death because the Lord said, on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And that is spiritual death. 
says, death is a separation. The body without the spirit is dead, James says in James chapter 2. And when man sins, he separates himself from God and becomes spiritually dead. Isaiah talks about the fact that our sins have separated us from our God. And notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6. 1 Timothy 5 verse 6. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. You see that? You can be dead while you live. And that's what it's talking about with Adam and Eve, that they were going to die the day they ate that fruit. And the reason is because it was sin that God could have no fellowship with. And so they were separated from God at that point. And they recognize this. They, they know it immediately. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 again, says the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, to make coverings for themselves. Do you see that? They know they're in sin. They're trying to hide that sin. So they are filled with guilt and they are filled with shame. And by this, we also understand, you know, sin is supposed to be abnormal for us. Sin is supposed to be something that feels odd to us. God created us in his image. He created us to have fellowship with him. He created us to be pure. And when we sin, we should feel bad about that. That's good. Guilt is good. Shame is good because we want to be driven back to God. We want to get out of sin. It should be uncomfortable and unpleasant for us. But there are some people who become accustomed to sin. And this is what the Apostle Paul is writing about in Ephesians chapter 2. If you remember there in Ephesians chapter 2, he describes men who are so used to sin that it's their nature to sin. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. By nature, children of wrath. You see, there are some people, again, who believe that when we're born into this world, we're born wholly inclined to sin. The Bible nowhere teaches that. Adam and Eve were not wholly inclined to sin when they were created. And they were created in the image of God, and we're created in the image of God. We can't be created in the image of God and be wholly inclined to sin at the same time. But we can have a nature that it says here, nature that is a nature of the children of wrath. Well, how does that happen? It's acquired nature. It's something by practice, by habit, that that's just the way we begin to behave. That's the way we begin to think. That's the attitudes that we have. That's what it is to be a child of wrath by nature. And so some people get to that point where sin is not abnormal, but it's normal. Where sin is not unusual, it's not uncomfortable, but it's the norm in their life. It's very comfortable for some people to live in sin, but that's not how God made us to be, and that's not how we should be. If we find ourselves comfortable in sin, we are in a very bad and dangerous situation because our conscience has been seared, and we are in a hardened condition, and we are doomed under that condition. We need to soften our hearts to receive the truth. Something else that we see in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve were filled with guilt. They were filled with shame. And when God confronts them, they try to shift responsibility away from themselves. In Genesis chapter 3, remember again, when the Lord confronted Adam, in verse 11, he asked him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Verse 12, Adam responds to the Lord saying this, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. You see that? It's the woman's fault. 
And really he's saying it's God's fault, but he's saying it's the woman's fault for doing this. She she gave me of it and I ate almost like Adam is saying, well, I was powerless. Once she handed it to me, there's nothing I could do. And that was a lie. But he's trying to blame the woman. And when God addresses the woman, she says, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's the serpent's fault. So they're trying to shift the blame, but God does not accept that. God does not allow them to shift the blame because in 17 through 19, which we read just a few moments ago, God pronounces a curse upon both the man and the woman. Here's the consequences that are going to unfold because you committed sin. You made that choice. And each of us is personally and individually accountable, just like Adam and Eve were personally, individually accountable. They couldn't blame someone else, not even the devil. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, it says, Therefore, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, whether according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for everything we've done in the body, whether good or evil, whether right or wrong. We can't shift the blame. We can't say it's somebody else's fault. We can't say that it's our father's fault, that it is some ancestor, including Adam. Have you ever read Ezekiel 18 and verse 20? And really think about this. If you have been told Well, you inherited a sin nature. That's why you commit sin. You just can't help it. If you've been told that, go and read Ezekiel 18, 20, and really the entire chapter. But verse 20 sums it up for us very well, where he says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Do you see that? Adam's wickedness is not on us. My father's wickedness is not on me, and my wickedness will not be on my son. We understand that it's our own choices, our own decisions, our own actions for which we are responsible and accountable, not somebody else's, and thankfully so. So we can't shift the blame and say, somebody else is at fault here for what I've done. No, we make choices, we make decisions, and we sin against God, and it's our responsibility to deal with it properly. Sin brings punishment, of course, as we read a while ago, the various punishments that the Lord pronounced upon the man, upon the woman. And let's just understand this, that sin makes our life more difficult. Adam and Eve had a really good life before they committed sin. They were in the garden. They were enjoying the garden. They were at peace. They were relaxed. They they tended and kept the garden. So they had things to occupy them day in and day out. And they were in fellowship with God. But when they sinned, then difficulties come. They turn against each other as Adam blamed Eve. And they end up facing greater hardships, greater difficulties in their lives. So sin brings punishment. And let's understand that when we sin, there is a consequence. There is a punishment that comes with it. There may be consequences we face in this life, physical consequences, maybe even in the body that we face. It could be consequences in relationships, consequences in our financial life that troubles arise because we've entered into sin. But the greatest consequence is the fact that we're separated from God, just like Adam and Eve. They were separated from God. But God put something in place for that consequence to be removed. And he spoke of this again in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity, speaking to the serpent here, to the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, God had a plan to solve this problem, the problem of sin. Man could not do it on his own. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says very specifically, 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. See, he was emphasizing here, this is the seed of the woman, that seed that would come and be uh, hurt by the devil, but he would crush the devil. So his heel would be bruised. And that, of course, is a reference to the crucifixion, but he would crush the head of the Satan, bruise the head of Satan. That is a death blow to the devil. Remember what Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 talk about as he's describing it here. He says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So yes, Jesus had his heel bruised, but he crushed, he destroyed the power of the devil and brought redemption to mankind. But this redemption can only be had by those who turn to the Lord and submit to his will. In Hebrews chapter 5 now, in verse 9, notice what it says here, Hebrews 5 verse 9. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. If we're not willing to obey the Lord, we cannot be recipients of the salvation that is in him. But if we will obey him, we can receive that salvation. You see, Adam and Eve had the same problem that you and I have. When they were tempted, they committed that sin. They're separated from God and there's nothing they could do about it. The only way that the cleansing could come is by submitting to the will of God. And the only way our cleansing is going to come is by submitting to the will of God. It's, it's not anything we're going to earn, not anything we're going to put God in debt to us about, but it is about us submitting, obeying the will of God. When we do that, it says that we will receive the remission of our sins. So we encourage you, as you reflect on your own life and as you think about this great story that is found back in Genesis chapter 3 and how our parents long ago, Adam and Eve, were tempted and committed sin and all the things that unfolded after that, the guilt, the consequences, it happens in our life today. That story, if you will, is repeated again and again. So let's learn from them. Let's not believe the lie of the devil. But if we do found find that we have believed his lie, let's turn to the seed of the woman. Let's turn to the Savior who can deliver us from the guilt and the shame of that sin and deliver us from death that comes with sin and deliver us into an eternal home. So we encourage, we urge you, study the Bible, reflect on your life, and be ready to obey the will of God. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Did you know there are no denominations mentioned in the Bible? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus responds to Peter in telling him this, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. If we listen to modern men, you would think that Jesus commissioned his apostles to go out and to build many different churches, to go out and establish churches in their name, according to their preferences, their likes and dislikes, or maybe go into a local area and find out what the people want, and then establish a religious practice and religious organization that met what their expectations were, that pleased those local people. When we look into the world around us today, 
we see there are denominations of all kinds. You have different beliefs that people hold to, and one group believes different than another on the plan of salvation, or one group believes one thing about the nature of God or the nature of Jesus Christ, and another group believes and teaches something else. Then they have different practices. They have different ways that they worship, different days even that they worship, and what they do within those worship services. So they are all different and they have different names. Some of them call themselves after the names of men. Some call themselves after the names of well, the way their religious group is organized. Some of them call it after certain types of actions or practices uh, that they get involved in. And then they have different organizations. They may have one person who's head over all of these groups, or they might have a board that's over various groups, or they might be independently associated with one another in a larger convention of some kind. But you look at all these different things, and when you look at them, it's confusing. Think about yourself if you were a complete outsider and you were trying to observe and find out, well, what here is right? What is good? What is acceptable? What should I do? And it's very confusing. And you have to ask this question, well, are they all right? Do Are they all equal? Are they all just as acceptable as each other? Or is there one that is right? Is there one that I can look at and say, that's the one that I need to be a part of? Or can I just pick and choose? Can I just decide whichever one that I like, whichever one that suits me, whichever one that gets me excited, that's the one that I want to be a part of and I can be a part of and that's acceptable. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and notice what the Apostle Paul wrote regarding this idea that men divided up and had different ones that they followed after. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of a Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? So the Bible, instead of commending, denominating, or dividing up based on different criteria, the Bible condemns it. The Bible says it's carnal, that is, it's worldly, it's anti-God, it's against God's will. Back in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, the Apostle Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see that? We talked a while ago. You look in the religious landscape around us today. And there's all these different beliefs and all these different practices. People are denominated, or another way to put that is they're divided up from one another based on different things, either name or organization, beliefs, practices. They're divided up. And the Apostle Paul says that's a carnal thing to do. Then he commands and says, this is what you need to do is be united and speak the same thing that there would not be any divisions, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So men think it's a great idea that there's a lot of different religious groups with a lot of differences among them so that you can pick the one that suits you. Well, what about this idea? What if instead of trying to please ourselves and trying to get a religion that suits us, that we look for the religion that is pleasing to God. We look for the beliefs, the practices, the organization that is acceptable to God, that is revealed by God in his word. Because remember, Jesus said, I will build my church. He commissioned the apostles to go out and to teach, and they establish the church. And so it is that we need to seek what that is.
what pattern is revealed, what teachings are revealed, what is explained to us in the scripture, what beliefs are we to have, what organization are we to have, what worship are we to have, what is it that pleases God? It's not anything that I decide. That's paganism. Paganism is where men decided what would please them, they turn that into a god or a goddess, and they worship that. But we need to find out what is it that Jehovah desires and doing what pleases and honors him. What would he have us to be called? How would we describe ourselves? That is found within the word of God. But there are some people who would say, well, why does it even matter? Does it really matter at all? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He says something that some people find rather shocking. In Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you see that there are people who said that they knew Jesus, that they strove to serve Jesus, and they did many things in the name of Jesus? But he says, I never knew you. So Jesus says there are those who are striving but falling short because they are not doing the will of the Father in heaven. We need to make sure that we are doing the will of the Father in heaven. It matters what we believe, what we practice, because there is something that is revealed that is truth. And then there are things that are not revealed that people do that is contrary to truth, and those are the things that cause the division. Those are the things that separate men from one another. Since there is no denomination in the Bible, then we need to understand that is not acceptable in the sight of God, and we should not participate in it or be a part of it. So we urge you to search the Scriptures, see what the Lord says about the church, its beliefs, practices, organizations, what it is called, and follow that. In the midst of the culture war in the United States, there is a battle over what something really means. How we define words has a fundamental impact on our convictions and actions. Take, for example, one of the big battles over the past 20 years or so, marriage. Does marriage mean something specific or is it open to interpretation as each individual sees fit? Many religious groups took a strong stand on this issue. They declared marriage is one man married to one woman. They rejected a man married to another man or a woman married to another woman. Their view was those things are not marriage, but perversion. One of the things they pointed to in defense of their stance was the Bible. Genesis 2, verse 24, shows marriage to be between one man and one woman. However, these same churches freely redefine other words, stretching them to suit their desires as they see fit. For instance, worship. What does that word mean? Are we allowed to make it mean whatever we like and adapt it to modern culture or what makes us happy? Look at what worship is in the Bible. As a basic principle, let us understand it was not ordinary activities of life or, to put it another way, all of life is not worship. Abraham and Isaac went to worship while Abraham's men stayed behind in Genesis 22 verse 5. Abraham was not worshiping on his way out to Mount Moriah, even though his actions and journey there were in obedience to God's command. Worship was a distinct, separate activity. For those who claim to live by the New Testament of Jesus Christ, we must accept that worship is narrowly defined. It consists of certain actions as outlined by the teachings and examples of New Testament saints. There is teaching the gospel, the Lord's Supper, giving, prayers, and singing, as found in passages like Acts 2.42, Acts 20, verse 7, 
1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16. We cannot change this to please ourselves and still legitimately call it worship, no more than we can change the definition of marriage and legitimately call it marriage. Let us take care. An attempt to redefine truth is rebellion to God, regardless of our motivations. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, a non-denominational group of Christians devoted to following the New Testament as the sole authority for our beliefs and practices. If you live in the area, we invite you to visit our services and get to know us. We have members who drive 45 minutes to an hour one way to assemble with us. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. There are millions of people that acknowledge Jesus is Lord. There are many who believe he came to this earth. He lived, he died on the cross so that their sins could be taken away, that he was resurrected and is now in heaven. There are millions upon millions of people that believe that, but not all of those people will make it into heaven. Jesus himself declared this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." These people here acknowledge Jesus as Lord, calling him Lord, Lord. And then they declare, here's all the things we've done for you, Lord. We've prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name. They're very zealous, very active for the Lord. But he says, I don't know you because you have not done the will of the Father in heaven. Not everyone, verse 21 who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, he who does his will. So in the day of judgment, there will be people who believe Jesus is the Lord, but they're going to be turned away and barred from entry into heaven. The difference between going to heaven and spending an eternity in hell is whether or not we are doing the will of God. It's not a matter of helping our fellow man. It's not a matter of sincerity alone. It's not a matter of how much passion we have. Though we need to help our fellow man, we need to be sincere. We need to have passion. We need to be on fire for the Lord. But if we have all those things and we're not doing the will of the Father, we're doing our own will, then we're not going to be acceptable in His sight. So we have to be people who are committed to God. It's a matter of submission to and application of His will in our lives. And the Lord illustrates this in verses 24 to 27, when He talks about the man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on the sand. So let's read that now. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He he taught with authority because he was the Son of God. So we need to listen to what the Son of God is saying here. This is a hard saying for some people. This is shocking for some people. You mean someone can believe in the Lord and end up losing their soul? 
And that's what the Lord's explaining to us here. And he gives this illustration of building a house on the rock versus building a house on the sand. These two men are doing the same thing. They are building a house. They're building a house, you'll note, when everything is going well and everything is going fine, that it's before the storm comes along and they build this house. And because there's no storm, because there's no pressure there at the time, building on the rock versus building on the sand didn't make that big of a difference. They both had houses that were standing, houses that they could use, that they could live in, and were providing them some measure of comfort or of shelter, if you will. But the foolish man built his house on the sand, which we understand is a sifting shifting foundation, rather, a shifting foundation. It's not a solid foundation. He could build it there on the sand probably faster and easier than building on the rock in order to put a foundation down on that rock. And what we have here in light of what Jesus said in 21 to 23 is this man who built his house on the sand is a man who did it according to his own will. He did it with passion. He did it with enthusiasm. He did it in sincerity, wanting to live in that home, but he did it by his will. And that's the idea that the proverb writer talks about. There's a way that seems right to a man, but what? Proverbs 14, 12. The end thereof is the way of death. So men who follow their own will, they end up in trouble. They end up in destruction. Their life ends up being wrecked. But the wise man, he says, built his house on the rock, on a solid foundation. That would take longer and it would be harder work. But because he's doing it by the Lord's will, he's doing it the right way. And he is going to be rewarded for that in the time of the storm. In Proverbs chapter 3 verses five and six, the proverb writer mentioned this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Again, going back to Matthew seven, what is it that Jesus said about this wise man? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man to build his house on the rock. See, we need to not follow our own ways, not follow our own hearts. We need to follow what God has revealed. That is when we're going to build our house on the rock. It takes longer. It's more difficult, requires more effort, but it's going to be that solid foundation in our life and doing the will of God. You know, the wise and the foolish man both faced a storm. They both built their homes. They built their homes for the same purpose, really for the same reason, under the same conditions, but they built them in two different ways or two different places, if you will. So they're striving for the same thing, but they have two different outcomes. That storm comes upon them. And let's understand the storms of life will come upon us. There will be difficulties and trials that we are going to face. And if we have our home our life, that is, on a solid foundation, then we'll be able to weather those storms. But if we have our lives built on the sand, it's going to be a shifting foundation. It's going to end up in destruction. And when we face the day of judgment, ultimately, as the Lord's pointing to here, if we build our house on the sand, we're not going to survive. We're not going to be welcomed into heaven. But if we build on the rock, we're going to be welcomed into heaven. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to face the trials of life. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to face the judgment before God on the final day. Now, the wise and the foolish both, let's understand, heard the sayings of Jesus. Go back again to Matthew chapter 7. Again, verse 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26, then, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. See that both of them are listening to what the Lord has to say. The difference is one person does the sayings of Jesus. Another person refuses to or does not do the sayings of Jesus. Just by being here and just by 
listening to even what we're saying at this present time, we are exposed to the truth. You can take your Bible and read the sayings of Jesus and his representatives, his ambassadors, his authorized spokesmen, the apostles and prophets. You can read what it is that the Lord would have you to do. You can know the will of God. So there's no excuse for us. It doesn't matter who we are. God has made this world in such a way that if we will seek him, we can find him. And he has given us his word that we can know. You know, some people have this idea, well, you know, the Bible's just so hard. It's just so difficult. But we need to understand that the Lord says, we can understand his will. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If we believe in a loving God, then we must believe he has revealed his will in a way that you and I can understand it. So we can understand the will of God. We can know the will of God. We can expose ourselves to the will of God. And we can know what Jesus teaches. We can know what he teaches about morals. We can know what he teaches about worship. We can know what he teaches about doctrine or beliefs and how we're supposed to uh, practice the religion of Jesus Christ and the difference between right and wrong. We can know all these things. And we see that the wise man And the foolish man heard the sayings of Jesus, but they reacted differently to it. It's sort of like what James writes about in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25 here. Do you remember what James said in James 1, verse 22? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So we have to do the will of God, not just hear it. Again, we go back to the idea of what Jesus talked about. The wise man, the foolish man, the wise man built his house on the rock, the foolish man built his house on the sand. You know, the wise is the one who hears and does the will of Jesus. He accepts it. He applies it. And this requires willpower. This requires a decision and discipline to do God's will and a willingness to make sacrifices. But the foolish man does not do it. He neglects the word of God. He's indifferent toward it, or he's rebellious to the word of God. And let's not kid ourselves. Sometimes we hear things from the word of God that we just don't like and we don't want to accept. And we might resist that and push against it. But we need to be humble and we need to be sober in our thinking realizing, you know what, Jesus said that I could possibly call him Lord and acknowledge him as Lord, and I can do many things in my life in service to the Lord, but in the end, come up short. In the end, be told by the Lord, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is, you act outside the law of God. You are not following the will of God. So I need to be very careful and examine myself. Is is that me? A- am I zealous, but I'm zealous without knowledge. I'm zealous in my own will and not God's will. And so am I building my house on a rock or am I building my house on the sand? We encourage you, we urge you, study the word of God because that's the will of God. And apply that will in your life. And when you do that, you are going to build on a rock so that when the storm comes and when the day of judgment comes, your house will stand. You will be welcomed into heaven, into eternity. So we encourage you to do that. If we can help you, please let us know. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. 
we invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. Psalm 144 verse 4 says this, Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. You know, our perception of time is often distorted, but the fact is time is constant. We all know that intellectually it's, it's constant, but our view of it is, you know, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast. It's usually slow when we're wanting something, when we're anticipating something, when we're pursuing a goal in life. And it's often seems to be fast when what we have, what we've accomplished, what we've reached is realized. And it seems like, well, everything went by in a flash. Uh, when we are waiting to go on vacation, seems like it will never get here. But we go on vacation and it seems like it went so fast. There are many things like that. Maybe in education. I know when I was in high school, it seemed like it would take forever to get out of high school. But then once I got out, the next thing I know, I'm 50 years old. It goes by in a flash. Maybe young people who are still in their parents' home wanting to move out of home or waiting to get married or waiting to have children. They think, oh, it's taking forever to get there for this to come about in my life. Or maybe those of us who are a little older, when we're thinking about or looking forward to retirement, we think, when will it ever get here? You know, 20, 30, 40 years going by. It seems like forever. But then when we get there, it seems like it's gone by so quickly, so rapidly. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, give us an admonition relative to time. Again, we have a distorted view of it. And sometimes because of that distorted view, we let time slip by. We let it pass without doing anything really that we need to be doing with it. And Ephesians 5, 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We need to redeem the time to walk in wisdom because we are surrounded by evil in this world and the devil will try to get us to waste time. We'll try to get us distracted, focus on things that are really not important, really not relevant, things that may be good in and of themselves and fine within their sphere, but we don't give the priority to the things of God. We're not seeking first the kingdom of God, and we need to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So as you think about your own life, you think about time, we encourage you to redeem that time, to submit to the will of God, to learn what that will is, to obey that will so that you'll be right with him, to worship him in spirit and truth as revealed in the word of God, so that you may have fellowship with him. And in doing that, you're redeeming the time, helping to lead others to the Lord, redeeming the time so that when the sun returns in judgment, you'll be ready for that. And you won't look at your life and realize, I wasted it. I let it go. I did not redeem the time. We would love to help you in that. So please contact us so that we can help you to understand the will of God, to serve God and redeem the time. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thou my buckler, my sword for the fight, be thou my...